the recording and okay so it is a great pleasure to introduce our last speaker for this uh, this year Shambuda Ghosh from the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics uh, Shambuda was graduated in 19 in 2009 from Princeton uh, and since then he's interested in uh, game theory and in political uh, economy and so uh, today, Shambuda will tell us about uh, Blackwell equilibria in repeated games. So Shambuda, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Elon. So um, to Elon and everybody, it's a great pleasure to be here um, and an honor to, to be able to speak in this crowd. Um, so I actually, you know, so I have, I have 33 slides. Uh, feel free to interrupt because I think this is um, not a lot of material. And, you know, I have two co-authors in the audience they should also feel free to chip in. So um, we are sorry we don't have a, a, a version of the paper ready to distribute. So this is the, the paper writing is in progress, but um, you know we have we have some of the results and you know most of the results we are interested in. Some getting worked on, some done. Um, so here we are, Blackwell equilibria in repeated games. So. So this is joint work with Kostas Kabunidis from Warwick University, uh, Johannes Horner from Yale, Elon Sola, first from Tel Aviv University, and Satoru Takahashi from the National University of Singapore. And I'm Shambhuda Ghosh from China University of Finance and Economics, but you already know that. So um, let's get started. So this is a very basic introductory slide. And the question is, why do we cooperate? Cooperation is costly in many situations. So we cooperate because of the threat of future rewards and punishments. So cooperation takes place under the shadow of the future. And this is an idea that remains through repeated games, which is the standard model of model, standard model for uh, capturing ongoing strategic interaction, right? So there are finitely repeated games, infinitely repeated games. Today, we are gonna deal with infinitely repeated games. And in particular, we are going to deal with discounted infinitely repeated games. Now, I know particularly in Israel, there's a, there's a large body of work done by several scholars on, on undiscounted repeated games. And you know, today we are not going to touch on that, but um, I'll, I'll get to talk a little bit about you know, what our philosophy is and how we see these results, okay? And, and why we pursue discounted repeated games. So the literature on discounted repeated games now, uh, I'm, I'm going to just keep saying repeated games from now on, meaning it's discounted infinitely repeated. So this literature has consequences that are fine tuned to what you do. And again, I, this is, I'm using sort of abstract words, consequences being fine tuned. So I will tell you exactly what this means that your continuation payoff, when you're mixing your continuation payoff, actually depends on which item you mix, your mixing throws up. So imagine you're playing left or right, heads or tails, you toss a coin. The toss of the coin determines not just your current action, but could determine your continuation payoff. So uh, the realization of mixing will be important in several of these results and folk theorems. And um, these results give very permissive and very powerful, strong results, but they use fine tuning and fine tuning is possible because there's precise knowledge of the discount factor. Okay, so, so there is, you know, typically there's a single discount factor that but you could also have multiple discount factors, but there's always common knowledge of the discount factors. So this paper says, what if we have less precise information on how play, players aggregate payoff streams? So we don't know exactly the delta that we are using, okay? Um, so let's say each person can have a different delta and I don't know what deltas are being used. The game theorist doesn't know, the players themselves might not know. And, and we want to come up with a notion that preserves discounting, but without assuming common knowledge of the discount factors. So what, why do I want to preserve discounting? Now you can agree or disagree with this, but our philosophy is that discounting captures something important, which is um, that you know finite lengths of time are worth something. No matter how patient you are, they're worth something. Okay. So if we do undiscounted repeated games, then you know big finite chunks of time might not play a role. So we 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 are deliberately steering clear of those models. And you'll see our model is very much about discounted repeated games, but we don't want to assume common knowledge of the discount factors. 
And you'll see how we modify the definition of equilibrium to take this into account. So let's look at repeated gains, the notation. This is standard notation. I'm just going to go over it. Um, there's a stage gain, capital G. It includes three things. First, capital I, one through N is a set of players. It's finite. Everything is going to be fine. AI is this finite set of pure actions of player I. Capital A is the cross product, Cartesian product of the AIs. GI is, is a player I's payoff function, okay? And it's a mapping from A, the cross, the vectors of actions, to a real number, just, just the felicity function or whatever you want to call it. Now, we are looking at perfect monitoring. So, history, so let's consider the repeated gain at the discount factor vector delta. Now, uh, discount vector. So I've written vector and then it shouldn't be zero one. It should be zero one to the power of n. So there's an n missing, right? Um, but if it's, yeah, so it's G delta and the, this is perfect monitoring. So the set of histories is a set of actions that you take, right? So, um, and it's a union of A to the power of T. So T, T Cartesian products, union over all T and, and that's, that's a set of all possible histories. Okay. And sigma i maps all these finite histories into mixed actions of player i. Okay, so this is actions observable, perfect monitoring. What does player i maximize? Player i's maximized payoff is denoted as capital ui delta of sigma. So sigma is a profile of strategies. And the utility of player i when player i has discount factor delta is that term you see. So um, GIAT is the is a utility at time t, and um, this is discounted by delta to the power of t, not t minus one, because we are just counting time from zero. It's not important, and it's normalized by one minus delta. Again, it's not important, but we are just doing it so that payoffs are comparable across the repeated game and the stage game, so the units are the same. Uh, if you get one at every point, then you get one in the repeated game as well. So let's look at a very quick standard classic undergraduate example, cooperation in the repeated prisoner's dilemma, two players, okay, a, uh, one and two, CD, two actions, corporate defect. And we all know you can just check D is a dominant strategy, four is bigger than three, one is bigger than zero. It's dominant for both players, the only Nash equilibrium is one, one. Okay, that's a prisoner's dilemma. And let's look at the grim trigger strategies. The grim trigger strategy says, everybody starts by playing C, and in any history that just contains C, we continue playing C, okay? So if H contains no D, and as soon as somebody plays D, we switch to playing D forever, right? So this, you can draw an automaton picture. We've all seen this undergrad stuff. And I, I, you know, I wasn't explicit about saying we start with C, but it's implicit in the first line if H contains no D, right? So the beginning will also be C. And this is an SPME for delta greater than or equal to one third. Now, the only point, the only interesting thing here is that this strategy profile is an SPME for all discount factors greater than or equal to one third. And this is formalized by Friedman's folk theorem. And here I'm just going to state this again, this undergraduate folk theorem for you, but in a strong version, this is not the version we see in textbooks usually. Uh, and I'll tell you exactly why this is a strong version and how this relates to our work. Um, so let's go to the strong Friedman folk theorem. Let N, script N, be the set at Nash equilibria of the stage game G. Now find the worst Nash payoffs. W, I, N, E, so the worst W for worst, I, player I's worst, N, E, Nash equilibrium payoff, is the minimum of G, I, alpha, where alpha belongs to N. So just go over all Nash equilibrium and find the worst for I, as simple as that. Um, find the feasible set. So A is a set of, pure action profiles, G of A is a set of payoffs of pure action profiles, so a bunch of finite number of dots in payoff space in RM. And CO is just a convex hull operator, smallest convex set containing G of A. Okay, so that's a feasible set and uh, um, of the stage game. And, and um, uh, what we are gonna do is state Friedman's folk theorem next, Friedman 1971, in a slightly stronger form. This is the famous Nash Threat Spoke theorem it uses a public randomization device. Okay, so if V it belongs to the feasible set, so it's a feasible payoff. And for every I, the payoff of I um, 
in in v is strictly greater than the worst Nash equilibrium of i, then we can find a delta upper bar less than one and a strategy profile sigma star that is an SPNE for any delta greater than or equal to delta upper bar. Okay. And this okay. achieves the PR vector V. Yes, sorry, there was a question. Yes, I mean, so the WI and E could be higher than the min max payoff that's normally used in the box. That is exactly right. Thank yep. you for this comment. And we are going to get to it right, right after uh, uh, the next bullet point. So, so two things I want you to notice about this. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is that the same strategy profile works for all high enough deltas. So when you look at the undergraduate statement of this in, in, in textbook, it says, well, there is a delta upper bar. And if, if you give me a delta that's greater than or equal to delta upper bar, then I can give you a sigma star that achieves the payoff V. But I flipped the order. So I've written down there exists a delta upper bar and a sigma star such that this sigma star works for any delta above the cutoff. So I want to emphasize the fact that Friedman Actually allows you to, uh, Friedman actually allows you to come up with a uniform strategy profile. So strategy profile that works for all discount factors above delta upper bar, and this is a property that we will try to retain. This is a property that we will try to capture in our definition of blackberry equilibrium. And second, the the very helpful comment that just pointed out is that this is a sufficient condition only, right? So. We will show you, in fact, you know, not we, but I will show you in the slides, but it's known from the literature, if you didn't that masking, that's the next slide, they show you that actually we can define something called the min-max value, which will typically be lower than this. Of course, in games like Prisoner's Dilemma, the game you just saw, here you can check 1-1, one, one, that's, that's Nash, and it's, it's, it's also min-max is 1-1. One, one. Um, so there's no difference, but in, in, in typically, okay, in games, the, the min max will be lower than this. So how do we define the min max? So we are minning I and max, I is maxing her own payoff. So whatever we do, I will respond with, a, with the best action from her arsenal. So we are maxing over AI inside. And outside the outer, outer layer is we are minimizing over all possible mixed actions um, that are, again, this is independent mixing. So this assumes that the players do not have uh, 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 a secret semi-public randomization device. So if we had a semi-public randomization device where you know, players other than I could coordinate and, and, and uh, um, toss a correlated coin, then possibly this could be lower, but we are just looking at independent randomizations okay, over the mixed actions of the others. This is a completely standard definition of min-max uh, and that's WI. Now, NE is gone, the index, because it's nothing to do with Nash. And it's very easy to show that every SPNE payoff vector V satisfies that for all I, VI must be greater than or equal to WI. Okay? And this is just, a, you know, you just deviate, you just deviate uh, um, one shot. And suppose you're earning less than WI, then I must be doing something stupid. She should just deviate to the best response period by period. Use her opponent strategies, track what they're going to do, play a best response to that. And, and then she's going to earn WI in every period by construction. So then overall in the repeated game, she's going to earn at least WI. So she was not playing optimally before. Okay, so that's actually not even SPNE. It's even in Nash that this property holds. Okay, conversely, and this is the Führenberg mask in part of the folk theorem. If F is full dimensional, so uh, I'll tell you in a second about full dimensionality. Um, it just means that the dimension of the set F is equal to the number of players, okay? Um, suppose V belongs to F, again, feasible payoff, just like before, VI is greater than WI. Then we can find a delta upper bar less than one, such that for any delta greater than delta upper bar, there exists an SPNE. Again, we could make it greater than equal, doesn't matter. There exists an SPNE sigma of delta that achieves V. Now, if you look at this for a second, and then we go back to the last one, you will see sigma star is chosen before the delta is handed to us. So that's the difference. Here, we are retaining the right to fine tune the SPNE to, to take into account the, the uh, discount factor. So this is the anything goes result. So basically, from the first result, we know that we cannot get less than WI. 
And this says, as long as VI is strictly greater than WI, so the only thing we can't say anything about is a boundary, but modular the boundary, we, we, are, we are good to go. Um, anything goes if there's a patient, right? But there is this bit of fine tuning that's happening. And let me just talk a little bit about the, the, the strategy of proof of Fudenberg mask in 86, and that will clarify why, uh, um, why this is uh, uh, fine tuned, okay? So um, given a target payoff, so suppose we're given a target payoff and a sufficient discount factor delta, we construct an equilibrium strategy using a three phase three phase strategy, okay? So phase one is um, you, you play the, the uh, normal action. So this is normal phase. So basically you play the actions that are required to achieve the target P of V, okay? Um, then suppose I deviates and you go to the, suppose I deviates unilateral. So multilateral deviations are ignored, but that's not a problem because this is part of the Nash environment, so we are never concerned about multilateral actions, okay? Um, so if I deviates, sorry, we are never concerned about multilateral deviations. So if I deviates unilaterally, all other players will play the min-max action against I for finitely many periods, okay? And this is enough, you know, you have to play enough so that I doesn't want to cheat. And this incentivizes the normal, normal phase, okay? Um, and it also incentivizes the next phase. So after the punishment is done, all players other than I, and who's I? I is the last player to be punished. Whoever was the last player to be punished, that's player I. Uh, all other players will be rewarded for carrying out the punishment against I. Okay. Now, the, the important thing, so you can just, just visualize the picture. I'm sorry, I didn't set this up properly. And uh, I can't draw the graph, but but um, you can you can visualize this this in your head. There's a point on top which is which gives a good payoff, and then we're going to you know min max, and then we're going to go lower down. We're going to the southwest corner of the point V, right? So which means you're we're going to lower payoffs, but we are going to reward those players who carried out a punishment. So we will reward them slightly. Now the question is how much to reward them? Can we reward them a fixed amount? The answer is no, we cannot reward them a fixed amount because the amount of reward could actually depend on what they did. It depends on what min-maxing is. So suppose min-max, so let's just go back to the definition of min-max, here we are. Suppose the minimum is attained over a pure action. Suppose in order to punish Ms. I, all the, all the other players, Mr. J's, just need to play a pure action then we have no difficulty. We can give them a constant reward. But now suppose J has to mix over, there's one J who has to mix over two actions, two pure actions in order to punish I. Okay, this is quite common. Then what's going to happen is um, we, we need to adjust the continuation payoff of player I to make sure that, sorry, we need to adjust the continuation payoff of player J, the person who carried out the punishment, to make sure that during the punishment phase, J is actually indifferent over the actions in the support and J will actually randomize over those pure actions. So imagine J has two actions left and right and left is always better for J. Then J, if J plays more left, then you need to give J a slightly lower continuation pair. How much lower? You have to calibrate it exactly such that it cancels out the left-right gap right? It, it, it has to be exact. And that calculation has to be done using the discount factor. Okay. So this, you know, immediately makes us suspect maybe there's a problem. Maybe this is not going to be an equilibrium at nearby discount factors. Okay. Now, this is our question. So knowing discount factors is a tall epistemic order. Okay. So, the, so for applications, particularly game theorists might want to so we think of ourselves as being outside the model and we are asked to provide strategies. And we might want to provide strategies that do not use precise knowledge of the discount factor. Um, excuse me? Yeah. I'm sorry to, <laughs> do I understand correctly that the problem is that you don't know how long the punishment phase should last if you don't know the delta exactly? No. 
So if you don't know the delta, so imagine, so suppose, just suppose that even the, pun that the punishment phase just takes one period. Okay. That's fine. Okay. But in order to punish you, I need to mix over two actions left and right. I see. And so you you left cannot get indifference when you don't know the delta. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. I will always play left and left gives me two and right gives me one. So then what you have to do is you have to, I got one extra by playing left. So then the game theorist has to subtract two times, you know, one minus delta, right? He's going to figure out, oh, this is the, the bonus you got because you got lucky. And maybe you got lucky, but we're going to remove all that luck because otherwise I'll keep on pretending I got lucky. Okay. okay? Thanks, yeah, so okay. that's the problem. That's the problem. So knowing discount factors is a tall epistemic order. So in many applications, the game theorists might want to provide strategies that don't rely on the exact discount factor. So imagine you're doing a regulation problem. So the regulator doesn't know which exact firms the regulator is going to face, but knows that, okay, the firms are patient enough that given the market interest rate, we can say the firms are, you know, one divided by one plus R is, you know, at least 0.9 or 0.87. So we know this is a minimum discount factor, but we don't know if it's 0.87 or 0.91 or 0.95. So we, we want to get, okay, something that is robust in this sense. So international agreements is another one. Heads of state might be changing. You do an agreement today, but you want to make sure that even if the next person wins, right? You guys just had an, uh, a change of head of state. So, so this should resonate with you. Uh, all international agreements require that, that you know, this should be robust to, to such changes. Legislation, for example, legislation, you know, there are, there are parties legislating things. There are many targets of legislation. We don't know their individual discount factors. Um, so that's the kind of, and in some of these examples, a player, for example, in a bargaining situation, a player might represent aggregate agent preferences. So there are a bunch of agents that you're bargaining for. Many, many workers or many, many firms, they have slightly different preferences. Can we get this sort of one size fits all thing to work? Um, now, we don't want to go down the Bayesian route because somebody might ask, fine, why don't you have, you know, if you don't want to have a, a common knowledge of discount factors, why don't you have, you know, beliefs over discounts and beliefs over beliefs, beliefs over beliefs over beliefs. That kind of thing is very unwieldy. And, you know, uh, uh, I think Shmuel Zamir was, a, is, is, was, or at least was, and maybe is in the audience, and he's done a lot of work on, on this topic. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely complicated. Plus, you know, that, that also, you know, how do those beliefs come about? And there are many questions that might be asked. We want to kind of step back from those and say, okay, what can we do when we know that there's a patient, but not precisely how patient they are? So that's our setting. So we introduced this notion of Blackwell equilibrium. Um, so Blackwell equilibrium is basically something that works for high enough discount factors. That, of course, this is, I'm going to give you precise definitions here right, right on the slide, but that's what it, is, it basically is. Now, uh, the, the first version of our paper was called Blackwell Equilibrium. We were very excited to get a, a two-word title because uh, I've never managed to get a one-word title, but a two-word title seemed very good. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, somebody has introduced Blackwell-Nash Equilibrium for stochastic games, so we can't do it. Uh, however, their, their work is quite different from ours because they are concerned more with existence, right? So they're in their setting with stochastic games, it's a very non-trivial problem. Um, in our setting, it's not a non-trivial problem because, you know, we have a repeated game. So as long as we have a stage game Nash equilibrium, we can just repeat that. And, and, and that's an equilibrium of the repeated game, okay? So, so we are looking at very different things. But the thing that we are interested in is sequential rationality. That's, they're just looking at Blackwell Nash. So they're not concerned about sequential rationality, which is something that both the notions Blackwell equilibrium and Blackwell PPE will respect. So let's go over the definitions. A strategy profile sigma is a Blackwell equilibrium above delta, lower bar, which belongs to zero one, okay? If sigma is an SPNE of, of um, G infinity delta for any delta, right? 
that is exceeding this delta lower bar component by component. And now this is for perfect monitoring gains. And for imperfect monitoring gains, we haven't introduced a model of imperfect monitoring yet, but you know, we're just telling you, we are going to talk about a Blackwell PPE, uh, perfect public equilibrium above delta lower bar again, if it's a PPE for any delta with delta i greater than or equal to delta lower bar. So it's the same thing. In one case, it's SPNE, one case it's PPE, but the same sigma works above delta lower bar, pair by pair, of course. Right? So essentially, you can just stick Blackwell to any solution concept for discounted repeated gains. Any questions? Okay, so now that we've introduced the main concept of a Blackwell equilibrium, we are continue, we're going to continue looking at just a little bit of the motivation behind this. So this is historical reference. We are honoring Blackwell, of course, by extending his Blackwell optimality to actually, I, I think the slide should have been called Blackwell optimality rather than Blackwell equilibrium. So this honors Blackwell by extending it to discounted gains from single agent dynamic decisions. So that's Blackwell's famous theorem, 1962. Any finite MDP Markov decision process has a stationary strategy that is optimal above a cutoff discount factor. Again, the strategy is, is optimal above a same strategy above a cutoff discount factor. Um, and this sort of strategy is said to be Blackwell optimal. Now, um, this doesn't help do, do this doesn't give our result because this is for finite MDPs. Uh, our set of histories is not finite, right? It's an infinitely repeated game. Okay. So in a Blackwell equilibrium, sigma, each, each sigma i is Blackwell optimal strategy in the MDP that is introduced by, in the non-finite MDP introduced by the game G and the strategies of the other players, so sigma minus i, right? So we have to find simultaneous, so it's not finite, and we have to find simultaneous uh, Blackwell optimal strategies for one per player. Okay, so this is a, a, a quick summary of the results. Some of this stuff might seem myst mysterious because we haven't spelled things out. It's not that, you know, uh, um, we will spell things out later on. This is kind of a very bird's eye view slide, just, just to give you an uh, um, overall picture. So the bite of Blackwell restriction depends on monitoring, okay? Roughly speaking, as the monitoring becomes worse, when monitoring becomes worse, Blackwell equilibrium has more bite. So the more you can monitor, the more constraints you can impose from outside. So then monitoring the, the, the Blackwell constraint is less important. Another way of thinking about this is intuitively, you see, we, we talked about this earlier and uh, uh, Bernard asked this question and um, I, I mentioned that the, the problem is that there is mixing going on, right? So mixing is a major issue. So when you have, when you have mixing, um, suppose you can monitor certain things, suppose you have perfect monitoring, then you can't see how I'm mixing, but you can at least check if I'm mixing over the right things. As soon as I play something off the support, you say, aha, you deviated, so you can catch me. So then you have ways of detecting some deviations. So then Blackwell monitoring has less bite. As, as, as you, you know, as mixing, as you have worse monitoring, it becomes harder and harder to monitor mixing. So it becomes harder and harder to give incentives for the right kind of mixing. So then fewer and fewer things satisfy the Blackwell criteria. So under perfect monitoring, you will see that pure actions are of course fine, Nash is fine, and some other types of mixing is also fine, but many types of mixing cannot be done, right? Because in the standard perfect monitoring world, all kinds of mixing can be done. There's no problem, you just have to adjust the future incentives. But here, not knowing delta means you cannot adjust, you cannot adjust future incentives exactly. So then you have um, a difficulty. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah. Sorry. Yes, uh, no, no, no. Go on. Go on. If, if, if you, I mean, so you have no statistical test to even uh, check whether mixing is uh, compatible. I mean, you might uh, use very bad probabilities uh, with the right support. I mean, and you say you cannot detect uh, that. Is that correct? 
Right. Even that will not be enough. And the reason is we need exactness. It's so we want to emphasize the standard folk theorem has a very knife edge construction there. Okay. Right. It's not many of these, you know, statistical tests. If you think of um, um, Radner, for example, Yari, Manan, Yari, Radner, they have lots of work on using statistical tests. Statistical tests typically, you know, tests within a band. You're within this range, but it's going to turn out here. Exactness is very important. Okay, so these things will not work. Um, okay, now when we go from perfect monitoring to imperfect public monitoring with the PRD, okay, we will get similar action, the same action profiles as under perfect monitoring, and the public randomization device will be useful. And then we will go to generic imperfect public monitoring without PRDs. And then we will see that we can only get pure, pure meaning pure action profiles or stage game Nash actions. So basically, as we go from, from perfect monitoring to generic PRD free and perfect public monitoring, we will not be able to support anything more than pure actions and Nash equilibrium. Pure actions you can see are easy because you, know, uh, uh, you can make some incentives strict. Right, but but it's any kind of mixing, any non-trivial mixing is going to be a problem. And finally, in the extreme case, and this this is a this is a result that we are still working out some details. But with you know, with with um, generic conditionally independent private monitoring, and games with unique pure Nash equilibrium, in fact, we cannot even support pure actions. We can support Nash only, and it's it's impossible to support less than Nash. So, because it's just, you know, that's always there. That was our original motivation for saying there always exists an equilibrium. So we can't get rid of that. Okay. Um, so again, this is, this is, uh, uh, yeah. So this is perfect monitoring. Um, so perfect monitoring, we have uh, grim trigger strategies and, uh, we, we've shown this to you before. It's an SPE for delta greater than or equal to one third. And in our language, what we want to say, these strategies are a be not Bayesian equilibrium. These strategies are a Blackwell equilibrium above delta equal to one third, right? Because above this, the, the same grim trigger that I've given you works, okay? So this is just semantics, okay? So now uh, the trick is let's do, future. so here I want to emphasize that the treatment already had Blackwell optimal strategies. Friedman already was a Blackwell equilibrium. He just didn't state it in those terms because he wasn't thinking along these lines, okay? So now the question um, that we have to answer as well, because that's, that's you know, too, too weak a result. What about Feudenberg masking, okay? How do we incentivize pairs to randomize, okay? So Feudenberg masking strategies require randomization during punishment because it's min-max. So anybody mix min max, and then we need to randomize. So suppose pair I needs to randomize between AI and A prime I, then she must be indifferent between them. So that's the indifference condition. Given AI, so we look at the, so we look at sigma. What is the distribution of actions? What is the distribution of parts that sigma induces? Okay. Given that pair I plays AI at time zero. Okay. And we can, I mean, we can take it at any time, but in particular, let's start with time zero, okay? So then she must be indifferent over these. So this is our equality, right? On the left and right, the only difference is AI on the left, A prime I on the left, and these are the two pure actions that I is randomizing over, they must be equal. So our question is at the bottom of the slide, can we construct continuation strategy profiles such that the difference in continuation payoffs cancels out a difference in stage game payoffs for any large delta. So this is important. We cannot do it for one specific delta by like Feudenberg masking. We have to do it for any delta. Okay. But that delta we can say needs to be above point A, above point nine, whatever. So, so let's look at something called myopic indifference. So first let's take randomization between AI and A prime I, same condition as last page. But now we are going to rewrite it as a polynomial or actually a par series, right? Because it's an infinite degree polynomial. So it's a par series, it's a convergent par series. Del delta is uh, uh, between zero and one. Okay, so actually delta is between some delta lower bar and one, right? 
So this has to hold for all high enough discount factors and that's the condition. Now, this is the, the left-hand side is a convergent power series in delta, okay? It holds identically for all delta in this, in this range. Then there's the identity theorem from complex analysis, Alfors or wherever you want to look it up. Uh, um, this says that this must be the zero function. In other words, all the coefficients for every t has to be equal. So in particular for t equal to zero, you get that result, that gi, the, the payoff of i when i plays a i and a prime i, given what the others are doing, must be the same. Right, so myopic indifference, this is what we are calling myopic indifference. Given what players other than i is doing, i must be indifferent at that point of time over all possible pure actions in the support of a mixed strategy. Okay, so this is myopic indifference and it's a necessary condition. So now let's define script AMI. So script AMI is a set of all, all these big strategy profiles that satisfies myopic indifference for every player. So for every I, for every AI and A prime I, okay, in the, in the, in the support of, uh, um, alpha i, you will get the same payoff from playing a i will get the same payoff from playing a i and a prime i given what the others are doing. Now, what about pure action profiles? Of course, this holds for pure action profiles because there's nothing to check. It trivially holds. If it's a Nash profile, then for Nash profile by construction, it holds because everything is a best response. All the things that you're mixing over in Nash, they're all best responses, okay? But there are more things in it, not just, not just Nash and, and Pure, okay? Now, why are there more things in it? Well, you can think about AMI, script AMI, as Nash equilibria in smaller stage games. So Nash equilibrium says, whatever you're mixing over, you must be indifferent over. So suppose this is your support, you must be indifferent over things in your support. And these have to be better responses than things outside the support. But now we want to remove the condition that things outside the support have to be worse responses. We say, okay, you might have, this is perfect monitoring. We can observe if you're going outside the support. So we, we can deter that through the usual punishments. So we don't care about that, okay? Um, so, so we are going to give you, um, so, so then we will look at a smaller, smaller game. So even if those things are better responses, eliminate those. Look at a smaller game in which you have only the rows that we want you to mix over. And then in that reduced game, your, your myopically indifferent action is indeed a Nash equilibrium of the reduced stage game, right? Um, and and this, this means that we can think of this as Nash's of smaller stage games, right? That's why it contains more things. Uh, and our first theorems that you've already, we've already proved which is the necessity of myopic indifference, if sigma is a Blackwell equilibrium, SPNE or PPE, then the, the strategy that you play at every public history is going to be in script AMI. So it must satisfy myopic indifference. Now let's define the, so now we, we still haven't given you a folk theorem. So we, we have this necessary condition. So we have to give you a new min-max. Accordingly, we will give you the myopic min-max. Okay, so, so suppose players are restricted to play from script AMI in equilibrium, then player I can guarantee herself at least her MI min-max value. Okay, where MI min-max is exactly like the standard min-max, but you just take min over script AMI. Okay, now notice that script AMI is a subset of all possible mixed strategies. And the, the bigger the set you minimize over, the lower the minimum is. So the standard min max W is lower than WMI. Now I should have put, you know, I should have put I throughout uh, because we are look, looking player by player, but that's fine. Um, then, then look at N. Nash equilibria, all Nash equilibria are, and all pure action profiles are an AMI. 
So the pure one and the and the worst Nash are weakly bigger than mixed uh, than than the myopic indifference one. So the myopic indifference one lies between you know pure and Nash. Okay, it's lower than that, and it's it's higher than the standard min max. So it's in between. And actually, we can show, I will show you through an example that it's actually, you can make these strict. And let me state the folk theorem for you. The perfect monitoring black hole folk theorem states every black hole equilibrium payoff vector V satisfies that for all i, Vi is greater than or equal to Wi myopic indifference. So every player must be getting more than her myopic indifference min max value. This is the proof is very similar, exactly similar to the, to the standard result. You can just deviate at every period, then you cannot get worse than this in a repeated game. Conversely, as f is full dimensional, um, v is an f, so f is a set of feasible payoffs of the stage game, v is an f, and every i gets more than the myopic indifference, so the only change is we've added the mi on top. Then, V is a black hole equilibrium payoff above some delta, or delta bar if you prefer. So this is exactly the same as the standard folk theorem, except that the standard min max has been replaced by the myopically indifferent min max. Okay, and I want to say two things. We are using full dimensional f, and full dimensional f simply means you have enough players. Sorry, you have enough dimensions in the payoff set as you have players. So it's possible for me to reward one person and punish the other people. So increase one payoff and decrease the other payoffs or, you know, increase two people's payoff and decrease the third person's payoff. So we can independently reward and punish the players. They, they, they are not tied together. Okay. Um, and is there a question? I actually have a question about... Yeah. Um, so what do you mean exactly by a black hole equilibrium payoff factor? Because the um, payoff factor may very well depend on a discount factor delta for fixed um, strategy profile. Right, very, very good question, very good question. So I should have clarified this. So by black hole equilibrium payoff vector, I just mean that the, the so, so, so one notion that we use, it's just the, it's just the payoff, okay, of a, of the black hole equilibrium that we've picked at a discount factor above that. Oh, at, at one particular, um, okay. Mm -hmm. But, but, but you know, we, we can also do limits. So we can also do limits. We, so not every black, so if you take a, if you fix an equilibrium and you let Delta go to one, it's not clear, even if it remains a black hole equilibrium, the payoff could change. Yeah. And it's not even clear that the payoff has a limit, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that, that we might think is a problem. So we can also deal with that case, okay? By, by coming up with a different construction in, in a, we, we can construct equilibria in such a way that they actually have limits as delta goes to one and that limit will converge to the V that we want as delta goes to one. So that would be the more satisfactory notion perhaps, but yeah, we can, we can do that. We have an extension that, that, that does it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, conversely, now, so full dimensionality we talked about. Uh, okay, so one thing I want to emphasize here is that we don't have a, a PRD, so we are not using a public randomization device because this is relying on, a, on uh, another, another paper of mine with joined with Oni Dashlupto. Um, so what, what we do in this paper, we show how to construct action paths such that with a target payoff, so we have a target payoff V, we show how to construct uh, um, an action path that stays arbitrarily close to the target payoff. So not only do you get V, so suppose F is full dimension and V belongs to F and you fix an epsilon greater than zero, such that a small ball of radius epsilon around V is in F. So then we can show that for any high enough delta, we can find the sequence of action profiles, AT, that gives, at that delta, it gives V. And uh, for all continuation payoffs are going to be bounded by epsilon. So it never goes too far away. Okay? So this is a, we introduce a self-set theoretic property called self-accessibility that we define, but 
you know, I don't want to go into it here. It's, it's going to take us too far for me. Um, and finally, we have a corollary of Frobenius's theorem, which I'll just tell you what this says. It says that suppose there is a sequence X of payoffs, right? So these are per period payoffs such that the, the discounted payoff from for every point tau onwards, it's between A and B, right? Then if you raise the discount factor to delta prime, it's still going to stay between A and B. So now you can think of this previous result as saying we can keep continuation payoffs within a ball. And the next result says, well, whatever the ends of the ball are, you can keep it within that. So you can keep it within a cube. Even if you vary the discount factor, you can keep it within the cube that just encloses that ball, the hypercube with axes parallel, you know, with, with sides parallel to the axes that just encloses the ball. So basically, and this is also related to the arrow levari stopping theorem. So that's, that's a result on, on when to discard a security. And it says that, you know, if, if, if your patience increases, then you're not going to discard the security earlier. So you have a security that gives you positive negative payoffs. Okay, flow payoffs, you can get rid of it anytime you like. But if the discount factor increases, you're not going to get rid of it sooner. So this is basically a, a, a version of that. They, they both come from some version of Frobenius. So putting these two together, we have the following. For all I, for all delta prime, that's greater than delta. For all tau, we have that the continuation P of there is between VI minus epsilon to VI plus epsilon. So this defines a hypercube, okay? So just repeating, but DG construction, continuation payoff stay in the ball, epsilon ball around B. Patient's lemma then guarantees that the continuation payoffs at higher deltas, not just that particular delta, so at higher delta primes, will stay in the smallest high for Q containing B, V, epsilon. Okay, now why is this important? This is useful because we wanna keep continuation payoffs close by. Um, you see, the whole thing is we want the payoffs to be ranked. We want, we want to have a construction, think of the Feudenberg masking construction. The construction has a feature that if you punish, it's better to punish a deviator than to be punished yourself. Because if you punish a deviator, you're going to get a reward epsilon at the end of the punishment. Okay, so that's better. And we want to now keep the ranking intact. We want to make sure that the continuation payoff does not go away too far from the original target points so that we can repeat a construction similar to Feudenberg masking. So again, on path, we will play a sequence of pure actions that we get from Dashgupta Ghosh. Uh, this will give us the value V at that, at that discount factor. Uh, if I deviates, then we will mix, sorry, myopically indifferently min-max I for a certain number of periods, then we will reward the punishers, but without regard for how they punished. What does this mean? This means that we will not take into consideration how they mixed during the mixing phase, okay? Because we've already made them myopically indifferent, so we don't need to take into account how they mix. We don't need to adjust the future values in the continuation payoffs. So we can regard them Without, without thinking about this. Of course, if there are observable deviations, then we punish, right? If you go off support, then we punish, but if you're on support, we don't worry about, you know, how, how you're, uh, about your mixing, okay? Now, in order to do this, in order to make sure that it's still better to punish than to be punished, we have to make sure that continuation payoffs don't go too far away. And this slide just told you the continuation payoff will not go too far away. So then the relative ranking of all the points is going to be preserved and every pair will say, I'd rather punish the other person than be punished myself. Okay. And um, so everything is myopically indifferent. So we have the black hole property. Okay. So now I have a slight problem. I want to draw this for you. Um, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm for a second, going to go off video um, and, and, and excuse me for a second. Okay, so this is, this is a figure I, I, want to, I want to show you, okay? So this is a stage game, okay? So we have zero, zero, we have one, zero, 
we have one one. We have. I don't see anything we're drawing. I mean, maybe others do, but I don't. Okay, this is completely my fault. Uh, maybe the screen should be shared from the other device. Right. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just. Uh, yes. So these are the points. Thank you. Three zero and zero three. Okay. Um, so what's what's this is of course Nash equilibrium. Okay. Now uh, two's two's min max. The way we have done it in in everything is equal to one. Okay. Once min max. So this is the this is the Nash pair, N E. Okay. The feasible set is of course you join all this. You join all the points. That's your feasible set. That's F, okay. And this is the this is the worst Nash point. And now, if you look at, okay, so min one's min max. So for this, two is going to play half L plus half R, okay. And this will give one a payoff of uh, one half. Okay. So this is one half. So then the the Min max is able to support this whole set. Okay, that's min max. Right, so this is min max. This is a standard folk theorem. Okay, now uh, Friedman is here. This is Friedman. And in our case, but notice this, this. Um, R, R is always a dominant strategy, okay, for player two. And um, mixing half-half by player two is actually not myopically indifferent. There's no way you can support this. And we can show, and you just, you know, take my word for it, but we can show that when two mixes uh, three-fourth L plus one-fourth of uh, M, this gives a payoff of uh, three fourth to one. Okay, so we get sorry, we get this point three fourth. Okay, and this is our set. So this is our set. Our set is everything above this. So in particular, this region from the Pareto frontier is out. These payoffs are also out, they cannot be supported. So this gives you an actual example where our, our uh, strategies and our construction have bite. Okay, so that's the one I just did. I hope you can see my slides. Okay. So let me spend the last few minutes talking a little bit about imperfect monitoring. Um, so the basic notation, so um, there's a set finite set of signals y and, uh, and uh, pi is, is the monitoring function. It's a mapping from actions to mixed distributions over public signals. The primitive utility is a function of your own action ai and y and it maps from there to r. Uh, gi is the expected utility uh, because that, that depends on everybody's action, but you cannot learn anything more because you ultimately get UI of your own action and why. So by seeing your utility, you learn nothing more. And we're not going to deal with private strategies which can depend on your own AI, but, but we are going to deal with, oh, I'm sorry. Um, we are not going to deal with private strategies that where, where you can, um, uh, where your strategy depends on your AI, we will deal with public strategies only. So it depends on the, the sequence of public signals. Okay. Now, um, we, let's look at a folk theorem with public randomization. Okay. Much as possible with public randomization. We have a clean characterization only when monitoring has a product structure. So product structure means the public signal actually has N components. And each component, the i component is generated by the action of player i. And these are all independent. Okay. So that's the equation out there. 
we are going to assume that pi i has individual full rank. Okay, so this 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 set of vectors is linearly independent. Okay, and then we are going to define a folk theorem with public randomization. And again, for this, we have to define a myopic minmax. Okay, so well, a, a, a new myopic minmax, and this is defined using a standard kind of, you know, uh, Fudenberg Levine Maskin or or Matsushima algorithm. So a scoring algorithm. So look at the expression that is being minimized. It's today's payoff GI alpha plus some normalized continuation payoff XI of YI. Okay, that's the total uh, that's being minimized subject to the actions being in AMI. Okay, and the next subject to the inequality. What is the first inequality? The first inequality says I is playing a best response. So when I plays according to alpha, I is playing a best response. And the next condition says xi yi is non-negative. Well, if this is negative, then it means you can drive the payoff still lower. So then you're not at the minimum. At the minimum, this should be non-negative. So if you minimize i's payoff today plus continuation in this way, subject to everybody using a actions from AMI, then every then we get our uh, uh, min-max value. And we get a, a folk theorem that says if this public randomization product structure and individual full rank then every Blackwell perfect public equilibrium payoff vector V satisfies that VI is greater than or equal to this value. And if you give me any vector V that is in the interior of the set F subject to uh, VI being greater than or equal to this value, then we can uh, support that value as a Blackwell perfect public equilibrium payoff vector. Now, why do we have interior? Well, because we are going to use self-generation style arguments and, and that works for the interior. We will approximate it from inside and greater than equal doesn't matter because we are taking interior. So we might as well have taken greater. Okay, so, so again, we have a you know, fairly permissive result. Now, um, how many, I think I'm over time. Is that yes, Shambhula, I feel that our time is up. Okay. So do you want so, to wrap up things? So, so uh, maybe you can give me a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, so basically, I just want to I, I just want to tell you very quickly about the proof strategy. The proof strategy has two things in it. One is that we create a robust equilibrium. So we create an equilibrium that is robust. That so look at the construction point one. Point one says that is a perfect equilibrium for all delta belong to some small interval delta zero delta one. And then what we do is reboot. Now, what is reboot? Reboot means we have a public randomization device. We can toss the public randomization coin. And if the coin comes up with a probability number less than P, then we just forget the whole past history. So this changes the effective discount factor. So then we can shift the range of rebooting from delta zero delta one we can basically divide by delta one and reboot it up to this value. So then we can take a locally robust equilibrium and reboot it up to a black hole equilibrium. Okay, and then I'll just go to the last slide and, uh, and just tell you this one. So if we have no public randomization device, then if sigma is a black hole PPE, then it involves no non-trivial randomization. That is for every public history, sigma H is either a pure action or a stage game Nash equilibrium. So you cannot even do the myopic in different ones once you have no public randomization and generic public monitoring. So the combination of imperfect monitoring and the lack of a public randomization kills all non-trivial mixing. You can only get pure actions or stage game Nash. And I think we can conclude with that. Thank you very much, Mbuda. Are there any questions? I have a question. Um, Hi there. Hey. <laughs> um, I can I can see why the need to balance out uh, the outcomes of randomizations is very uh, tricky and actually impossible in case uh, right. when you're aiming for a specific payoff. But uh, when you go for the min max, actually you just need to be close enough to the minimax. And at least there is at least one paper that considers such a strategy without all the fine tuning of balancing. This is uh, one by Olivier Gosner about finitely repeated games. 
I'm not so sure, he, there he uses statistical tests. I'm not so sure how easy it is to rule out this kind of, uh, of structure here. Maybe, maybe you know of it, so, already thought of so, it. So, so yeah, so actually I, 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 should, I should take a closer look at the paper, but um, my, my, my impression is that, so, so what happens there is he has incomplete codes. I think this is related to his incomplete codes. So he basically has, he, indeed, he's approximately min-maxing, but then after, there are some stages that he's not specifying fully. And those stages he can later specify using precise knowledge of the discount factor, but keeping the overall structure the same. So we, we actually have no freedom to do that. We completely deny ourselves any freedom to have any part that is fine-tuned. I think he allows himself some freedom to fine-tune certain things. I think what he, what he doesn't do is to give uh, complete instructions for the equilibrium. Right. It's something right. like uh, you can achieve at least this and that if you use this and that strategy. And if everybody achieves this and that, then we're very close to where we want it to be. So uh, that's no, right. No, no. Uh, yeah. Th with this, you're right. Yes. yes. More questions? Yeah, I have. I have a question on on the terminology of this black. You have you, you use the name Blackwell to refer to Blackwell optimality in um, Markov decision processes, right? Right. That's your, um, that is a pure strategy. Are you also using a pure strategy here? I mean, I wonder whether the name is so informative. That, that's I mean, what I'm aiming at. Because I see. Uh, you could either call it I like, like optimal equilibrium or just maybe say something uniform or discount independent uh, optimality. I, I think that would be more informative than Blackwell because there's more than one theorem by Blackwell that people could associate. Right. With. So, so actually, if it's uniform, you know, I, I, so there's some work that's been done, uh, and uh, I think Elon should be the one to talk about yeah, it, uh, yeah. about so, uniform, yeah. because he's the expert. He, he has work on that. But yeah, I, I, I understand your concern, because we don't have, we, we don't have pure actions necessary. So, uh, but you know, we, we, we didn't want to, I mean, on path we play pure actions, but off path we could have, we could have uh, uh, mixing. And of course, in in in, in the the uh, uh, other phases in in the public monitoring phase that you know the, the public monitoring scenario, we could have mixed actions being played. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. I mean, I I if you I mean, but we thought you know that this is sufficiently close to Blackwell in certain senses that we are you know capturing the sort of essence of the Blackwell ness. Yeah, and do you, and do you use the proof at all, or do you just use the name? I mean, that's another question. I mean, do you? I we mean, just use the name. We don't yeah, use yeah, this proof in any way. I would rather go for a more informative name than than uh, I mean than, than a name. name. I see. I see. But yeah, I think we were also led a little bit by the fact that the name is catchy. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I mean, then even Blackwell Optimal Equilibrium would be, I mean, still catchy. I think. Okay. Elon, you have something to add? So uh, indeed, uh, we thought about it, whether to call it uh, Blackwell uh, equilibrium or uni or mention uniform equilibrium. Now, Blackwell equilibrium is an equilibrium that is, uh, that is equilibrium for every discount factor sufficiently close to one. Yeah, yeah. It is true that in MDPs, there is a pure Blackwell equilibrium, but essentially there could also be, no, be non-pure yes. Blackwell equilibrium. So, uh, whereas uniform equilibria are usually, uh, you will refer to, to uniform epsilon equilibria. No, 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 and, and in this but here, this Yeah, but here we have uniform zero equilibria. So it is also different than uniform equilibrium. No, no, I know, I know, but I mean, so, but I would maybe call it, I mean, um, discount independent or something. I mean, so if we call that's the key, I mean, mm -hmm. so that would be my suggestion, but anyhow, I mean, it's just a question and suggestion. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you very much. So if there are no questions, I'd like to take 30 seconds and say something. So, so th uh, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so, so thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, I, I, really, I really enjoyed speaking here. But I also want to take some time to thank my co-authors actually, uh, because this paper came about through a merger of a project between Costas and me and one between Johannes uh, Satoru Takahashi and uh, Elon. 
And they were very kind and invited us to join and then we merged the paper. And I think the outcome is a lot more comprehensive. So very grateful to them as well. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Shambuda, for uh, this interesting talk and very clear talk. I thank you all for uh, joining us in this, uh, this year. And I hope that we meet again in September and have a great summer. Thank you. Same to you. Yep. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Good bye. luck. Bye bye.